Let me take a couple of uh, a couple, just a few minutes, um, to set up uh, where we're going in Advent. Um, not so much um, spending a lot of time with it today, but to introduce introduce our theme. And so, Booth, just so you know, up there, who's behind the slide? Is that Kayla up there? Okay, I'm going to go out of order um, with my slides, but that's okay. We're going to be talking about expecting angels. Okay, and that's the way I came up with it. Um, instead of the kind of cliched, um, I believe there are um, uh, angels among us. Um, yeah, that's, I believe that to be true. But it's this idea of being expectant, of expecting the angels of God to show up and be around you in your life. Now, that sounds like a big thing. That sounds like a, a magical thing. But it's not. I want to bring it down, bring it down to earth, right? So next week, I'll go deeper into this, and certainly uh, by Christmas Eve, we're going to consider this truth. It's, it's how God works. It's, it's part of God. It's part of how God uh, keeps, God pro- keeps God's promises to protect and to provide and to be present, okay, are through angels. Not just a long time ago in the Bible, but even right now, we expect angels. And I'll be, again, unpacking that. And I welcome Wesley uh, uh, Methodist Church across the river. Um, I I can't see you, um, but I hope you can see uh, me and us and everything's coming in. I welcome you to worship this morning. The, uh, The objects around us, this is why we decorated the way that we did, is, um, the idea being, you know, we always start like at the end of October or something, and I had in my mind, like, I'd love to have big swoopy angel wings. What do you think? Did we pull that off? Do we have big swoopy? Okay. And, and Sean, uh, I don't see Sean. Sean brought us a lift, and that was awesome. We have a lift go up and go down. And uh, that was also the, one of the most wonderful things. Um, I was telling, um, actually, I was telling Sean to care of this. So we were working, putting stuff up, and I was on the lift putting up uh, lights and stuff and and it's the end of the day and and brandy um, our preschool director brought the two-year-olds in and they sat on the ground and everything i did they applauded it was just wonderful it's like <laughs> they were so cute they're like hey, pastor tom's going up yeah yeah now he's coming down yeah okay i need that group of two-year-olds just follow me everywhere i go just you all need that. We all need uh, those two-year-olds to clap for us. But um, we did all this, you know, the, the, the angels, the words, and all this um, to point us towards, to point us towards. That's what during Advent and, and Lent we always do, take a next step up with some of our um, objects and decorations. We do that because it's a special time in the church here, for one. Secondly, is it, is it points us towards in this case, angels and expecting angels. The angels that you see all around are the beautiful angels that we imagine, right? And so um, up here, Jennifer Smith uh, brought in some of her angel uh, doll collection, uh, Barbies, and um, that's how we imagine angels, right? It's one of the ways we imagine them, but biblically, probably not. Okay, and that's one of the truths to talk about. It doesn't mean these are bad. If they were bad, I wouldn't have them in front of you. Okay, but but the way uh, that we uh, can read about angels um, is uh, uh, different than this. Is that they probably look like this? Okay, it's like it starts with the very first mention of angels is in in Genesis and after the fall of of Adam and Eve and and sin comes into the world and and God sent Adam out right and put it says right here he stationed the cherubim the cherubim this cherubim were stationed right at the entrance to the garden of Eden so that he couldn't get in anymore and the sword this sword kind of went back and forth that's what we tried to kind of recreate with these lights um, that, that we put up myself and Brad uh, so put those up there in tubes is it like this sword this candle of this thing of light going by so so angels we say well well those angels um, the cherubim the cherubim are guarding the the, the, the entrance to the uh, Garden of Eden well that's wonderful fat little naked babies right is that what you're thinking cherubim right like yeah yeah they would be really effective guards wouldn't they right (laughs) no 
No. As we go through this over the next couple of weeks, there's four different kinds of angels talked about uh, in Scripture. Cherubim are one of them, and they're not fat, naked babies with wings. Uh, I showed you this earlier. It's probably more like this. We get the descriptions of the cherubim and the, the cherub, cherubim and the seraphim and, and two other kinds out of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelations. And, 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 and the, this was like a three-headed, you know, with a lion and an, and an, uh, an ox or a, a bull and a, and a kind of person-like looking thing that's cherubim not fat naked babies with wings everybody good with that so far so yes but we imagine it and it's okay just like the beautiful barbie angels it's it's it points us to that so a couple of other facts quickly is that angels you see are created by god and they are a, a spiritual entity that is totally different than human beings Sometimes um, they, they can take the form of human beings, like with Lot, it says, this is one of many examples of angels arrived at Sodom. Lot was sitting there and says, hey, uh, let's uh, come, come hang out, let's spend the night here, right? They had the form of human beings, but they were not humans all the time, not fully human. We are created in the image of God. Angels are not created in the image of God. Again, they are spiritual entities. And I know that people's heart's in the right place when someone dies, especially when children die. And we talk about that God needed another angel. That's incorrect. That's folk religion. God doesn't need your baby. Fair? And our babies and our loved ones and even grandpa and grandma don't become angels. They don't become angels. They, they are themselves. I don't want to be an angel. I don't want to be a fat, naked baby. Y'all with me? I want to be me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I've been there, done that, Joey. I've been there, you know. But uh, you, you don't become angels. They're separate, created by God for a purpose. And, and that's what, again, I'll be filling this in more as we go through Advent. But the purpose of angel are things like um, to minister. Angels, ministering spirits sent to those who are redeemed, sent to those children of God who believe in Jesus Christ. They're sent to minister and to help. Angels are, are sent with messages. Next week, we'll talk more about Zechariah. And he's a priest. It's John the Baptist's uh, earthly dad. And uh, Gabriel showed up to give him a message as he did to Mary and as he did to Joseph about how to go home and so we'll look at those angels and that purpose of angels angels also are created to guard us and I love this idea from Psalm 91 he'll put his angels in charge of you to guard you in all of your ways many people want to believe that you have your own personal guardian angel and I'm not going to disabuse you of that there's no proof of a personal guardian angel in scripture but instead and I think this is even better is that this idea of angels plural to guard us something to pray for something to call for for angels to guard you these are this is just kind of an introduction about expect angels angels are wonderful and they're mysterious and many people haven't bothered to think much about them so there are some people sitting here and some people online and some people at wesley including me that have an experience uh, in life we had an experience once upon a time that was wonderful and we tried to explain it and the only thing we could come up come up with was an angel some people have had those experiences. Angels are wonderful and mysterious. There's good angels, and there's also terrible angels. There are t terrible angels. They're called demons, okay? Again, all biblical. But today, I introduce this to say angels really do exist, folks. They weren't just a Bible thing a long time ago, and they really are all around us. And sometimes we see them, and sometimes we don't. This Advent, we're going to dig deeper into understanding that we can expect angels we can expect them. So that's where we're headed on that. I want to switch gears and move to this. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open them to John 17. As Jesus prays an incredibly important prayer for you. It's an prayer, a prayer for you and for me and for the church. And that's what it's about. It's, Jesus is about to, to be um, uh, put to death. And one of the last things he does, uh, as John records, is he prays. He prays. Um, you know, uh, he's talked about the Holy Spirit in chapter 16, and now he prays for himself. And then he prays for his disciples that have been following him, who will soon be apostles, meaning they will, they will when Pentecost comes, they will spread the word, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and the church is breathed into existence. And that's Jesus' next prayer for you, for the church 
is he says, my prayer is not only for them, meaning the disciples alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That would be us and the thousands and millions that came before us. I pray for them that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is uh, Jesus' prayer. And again, it's right before he goes to the cross to die and he's praying for his people to be in unity. Now, we may look at unity and think, well, really? We live in such a divided culture and a divided nation right now. Do you agree with that? Say yes. Unity? Yeah. The church is supposed to be countercultural, folks. Never, ever forget that. We are supposed to be, meaning people, the people who make up the church. We are supposed to strive and work and live to be counter the prevailing culture. In our prevailing culture, there's lots that I could say about it, but at the very least, we are very divided. And here's Jesus saying, "Uh uh-uh, not for my people. I want my people to live in unity. You don't have to look the same. We don't all have to have the same taste in clothes or haircuts or automobiles or tractors, right? Being in unity doesn't mean we all like the same kinds of food. It doesn't mean that we all uh, uh, vote the same. What it means is a sense of communion. And these are four important words that all are connected. Is that what Jesus is praying for is for all of those who claim to be Christians is that the Holy Spirit will bring them into community. All right? And uh, bring, uh, bring them into community and into communion with God. So Jesus prays for this. You know, today um, when we make a promise, I realize uh, the calling, uh, you know, the, the calling that we have. When we make promises to God and and, and the card, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but, you know, we we have something that we hold in common. Is that when we take the name Christian, when we say, yes, I want to be a Christian, I want to be an active Christian, I don't want to just be a a Sino, a Christian in name only, um, okay, then we pick up this calling. And our calling that we all hold in common, or we're supposed to, and it's part of what's supposed to bring us into communion and into Christian community, is, is this common uh, call to love and to serve and to obey God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in return, in return, it's a loving God. We hold in common this belief, this faith, that we have a loving God that knows each one of us has redeemed each one of us, cares about each one of us, and promises to be present, not be distant, not be far away, to provide what we need and, and to protect us, specifically when it comes to spiritual warfare. This is what our God promises, and we hold that in common, or I hope we do, and that, that holding those things in common is supposed to be what helps bind us together into the Christian community. Even like here, we have the Christian community. People have asked about that, like, are we Grandview Christian community or are we Grandview Methodist Church? We use the term Christian community to make sure that we connect and pull in Wesley Methodist Church in East Dubuque and Center Grove down on Dodge Street. They are part of Grandview. They're part of us. We're one church in three locations. And so that's the Christian community. But we hold this in common. And Jesus has prayed that everyone will experience this. I pray this. I want this. I hope this happens more and more and more, that people feel that sense of community, right? That sense, I'm a part of something. That's what we do every single Sunday. Say, turn around, look outside. You're going outside into the world now. Now, if you're comfortable, hold on to somebody's hand. Why? It's a subtle way or a big way to remember you're part of something. You're part of something. The Christian community, we hold things in common and then we ask God and we seek for God to bring us into communion. Let me tell you something really big. I think is big. And I think I want you to hold on to. I wish it would be written upon your hearts. And that is, why did Jesus pray this prayer for his people to live in unity? Why did Jesus pray this prayer that that 
his disciples then and right now, this minute, the people that believe in him, that, that we would live in communion with God and with one another. Well, I'm going to tell you why I prayed this prayer. Because Jesus knew then and Jesus knows right now that our best hope, folks, and our best source of strength for us as well as those who are not yet here, our best hope while we live in this broken, divided world, our best hope is the church. Our best hope is to live in community. Perfect? Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. We're trying to be. We're trying to be more like Jesus. Jesus prays for communion and unity in the church because he knows that the church is the best hope for people who are broken and, 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 and burned by the world that we live in. He knows that this is the best hope. And so that's a prayer as well as a charge to us, church, is that we do our best to get it right for everybody, those that are already here as well as those that are not here, that we be the people, that we be the place that offers more healing and more love and more care and more grace than any other organization in this community. You know, if it gets to the point where the corner bar is more loving and welcoming than a church, that church just needs to close its door. That's my opinion. What do you think, amen? This is supposed to be our business is to welcome all people and love them and care for them and, and, and put them in the feet of Jesus for him to heal them. And so Jesus prays for unity, and that's why. And that's why. And let me talk about this. Because, see, this is an instrument that I believe God is going to use for unity. And you can make this promise to God, even if you're not officially a member. I want to stress that. Even if you haven't officially joined. What this promise card is, first a promise is a vow. It's a promise to do something or not do something um, is what a promise is. And, and it's a, a serious declaration. So I'm going to do this. All right. And it, for Christians, we say, I'm going to do this with God's help. This year, I invited everybody on their green card or Wesley a pink card, I can't remember your color, I invited you to take an honest, prayerful look at, at these things uh, that you will promise to do in the year ahead. And these promises involve what? Well, this is where I started with us this morning during the focus. These promises <clears throat> involve putting ourselves into positions and situations where we become more susceptible, more open to God's Holy Spirit getting through to us. When you make a promise, it's a promise in regards to worship. How many times you're going to worship every, every, this coming year? You're going to count. You're going to make a promise. Here's how often I'm going to put myself in the blue chairs or in the pews, right? Or over at Wesley in the, in, in the pews, right? It's a promise to God through Grandview saying, I will promise to pray. I'm, I'm going to make a promise that I'm going to pray. Not asking you and giving you a rote cookie cutter brownie recipe prayer to pray. You talk to God as you want to talk to God, but it's a promise to pray. On the back, it's a promise to serve. And we even included a detailed, here's places that you can serve God and not just sit back and be served. Here's a, a promise. Here's how often I'm going to read God's word. And then, yeah, there's a promise to give to God because when we give our valuables, our money to God, it is an act of faith. It's an act of discipleship before it is a financial transaction. It is a faith thing. This is, I trust you, God. I trust the mission and ministry of my church, and I want it to go on. The promises put us in positions where we are more susceptible. Worship, prayer, scripture reading, serving, being part of the Christian community, susceptible and open for God to get through to us, get through to you, me, to speak a word we need to hear to give guidance, to give um, a change of perspective, a change of habit, habits or attitudes. It's, a, it's to put ourselves in a position for God to really help us and to even heal us. So these cards, these green cards, that's what they're for. They're not just to go through the motion thing. I don't want them to be a fire and forget thing. Like, okay, I threw the card in there um, because of peer pressure and, 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 and uh, by February I'll have forgotten all about it. I hope that doesn't happen. In fact, we're going to give you a little magnet. We're going to give you a magnet. If you throw in a card, you get a magnet. And it says, I promised God. Not me. You promised God. Okay? And, and I want you to put it, I think ideally you put it on your refrigerator about where your eyes and face are when you go to open it and you can't decide if you're hungry or bored. You all with me? 
And you go, oh, I, yeah, I promise God. It's right there, okay? Um, we're doing that, again, not as a fire and forget or go through the motion. It's a formal thing to help you, to help all of us grow, right? To help all of us grow. When we're, what we'll do is you'll bring those down when you come to receive the communion elements, and there'll be a basket there, and there'll be people there, and you'll put your card in, you'll do the communion thing, and then we're going to pray. We're going to pray a prayer of consecration. And I know that's a big $25 seminary word, but consecrate is to set apart. And so you see, we want not just our promises to be set apart and to be different than the rest of the world, but we want us to be set apart, consecrated. To be consecrated is that process of an object, a, a place, or a person being set apart for sacred and holy uses, right? So this building, this ground, the grounds around here over 20 years ago were prayed over, and, and in the name of Jesus, prayers were prayed to consecrate what we think of as Grandview, the same over at Wesley. This has been set apart for religious and holy sacred use. It's why when a church closes, there should be a formal time of grieving and deconsecrating that building and ground. Um, it's no longer set apart for holy purposes. That's what's supposed to, supposed to happen. We're going to do that uh, today. We're going to do that today. Um, again, we have these in common, these promises. We have in common a calling to love, serve, and obey God. We have these in common. And so today, may God help us, all of us, to make and to keep our promises, to fulfill our promises to God. Because you see, here's that last awesome truth. Is that when we put ourselves in positions and situations, and this helps us get there, it's kind of an accountability thing, God grows us. We don't grow ourselves. God changes us. God strengthens us. Okay, makes us more mature followers of Jesus. And then what happens? See, we have that in common. And when, we, when, when individuals have in common that God is working on them and working in them, and they come together with the rest of the Christian community, is that it helps bring us into communion, and it helps grow God's church and makes us strong. That's what we're after. So I invite you to bow your heads, take a deep breath, and let me pray about that, please. Lord God, Thank you for the possibilities. I pray, Lord, that you forgive us. Before we come to your table, I pray that you forgive us of our sin. I pray that you forgive us for those things that we have done and those things we've left undone. Forgive us for harm. If we've caused harm to your church, if we've caused harm to another one of your children, of another person, forgive us, Lord. Help us to arise, go forward, and do better, and to sin no more. I invite each one of us to take a few seconds of silence to confess our sins to God, please. And I say in the name of Jesus, be assured that you are forgiven. God promises to forgive our sins through Jesus Christ. Be assured that God can forgive any sin. Don't drag it around. Don't have it hanging around your neck. Ask for God's forgiveness repent and be forgiven. I pray this prayer for all of us and all of us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we say out loud, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.